I want to welcome you to today's Environmental Priorities Coalition 2021 Legislative, Media, Legislative Priorities Media Briefing. The Environmental Priorities Coalition is made up of more than 20 statewide organizations working to safeguard our environment and the health of our communities in the legislature. I'll now turn it over to Cliff Traceman for our legislative context and session preview before transition to brief presentation from the leads of our three 2021 priorities. At the end, we'll have a few moments, excuse me, a few minutes for questions, and then I'll make sure to share contact information by email with all of you in our press kit. Uh, it'll have information and contact information of all of our presenters if you'd like to speak to someone further, if you're curious about learning more or if you're on a deadline. So now I will turn it over to Cliff before we move into our presentations. Thank you, Zachary. Um, so yes, I'm Clifford Traceman, state lobbyist for Washington Conservation Voters and Washington Environmental Council and also help play a leading role in the Environmental Priorities Coalition that Zachary just mentioned. Um, we organize around priorities each year, um, 20 to 25 groups, and uh, you'll hear from my colleagues on what the three priorities are for this year. Just to provide some broader context, um, we try to pick issues where we meet the legislature where they are. We're always optimistic that we'll pass all of them. Um, two of our priorities this year are directly linked to the issue of transportation. So on my lay of the land, I'm just gonna quickly talk about that and Bryce Yaden later will go into more detail. But both the clean fuel standard, which you'll be hearing about and um, potential carbon pricing as it relates to transportation um, are gonna be a big part of the legislative session this year. Um, all the reporting thus far, I think has not um, focused on the broader issue of how carbon revenue could play a role in bringing a transportation package together. Um, the House has um, a lot of interests that align well with us. Uh, we're uh, working with the Senate on those issues as well, but we do believe a price on carbon can play a big role in solving the transportation dilemma and investing in um, people and communities as well. Uh, I will say uh, at a later time, we do have some polling to share that will show that voters and citizens do understand the nexus between putting a price on carbon and reducing emissions. And so we'll be looking in the transportation package to make sure that if they do use a price on carbon, we're actually reducing emissions. Um, we will um, also, uh, you hear from one of my colleagues, obviously we have uh, a lot on the budget this year, the, the pandemic and the uh, budget deficit that the state is facing, um, we believe we're well positioned to help work on those issues as well. So I think I'll stop there um, because uh, my colleagues will go into more detail and I'll be available later for questions. Great. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, my name is Darcy Nonamaker. I'm the Government Affairs Director with Washington Environmental Council and Washington Conservation Voters. I'll be talking about our first priority this year, which is Conservation Works. It is about the state's operating and capital budgets. Um, and obviously, in a virtual session, there's going to be a lot of crunch and a lot of difficulty in getting bills passed. But the one thing that the legislature is sure to do is adopt a new two-year budget um, for the 2021 to 23 biennium. And as part of that budget work, uh, addressing the four-year funding shortfall, making sure that the budget is balanced, uh, providing more support to people during this really devastating pandemic, um, applying a racial justice lens to spending and thinking about how we are not investing in black and brown communities uh, at the levels that we really need to um, as a state and uh, and also how racism kind of plays into our, our funding uh, priorities. But also to think about uh, and make decisions about investments to create jobs and economic opportunities in, in communities across the state. So quick, um, you all probably know this, but a quick uh, uh, educational overview. The state has three uh, budgets that it will need to adopt next year. One is our state operating budget, which pays for things like uh, implementing state laws and policies. Um, one is the capital budget and the third is the transportation budget. And then the last time that we faced a budget shortfall and a recession, 
the environment actually had uh, and environmental agencies and programs withstood steeper general fund cuts than any other area in state government. So for example, the Department of Ecology saw a reduction in general fund of about 63% between the period of 2007 and 2013. Um, so we know that the environment, when times get difficult, can actually really be a target for budget cuts. Um, and a well-constructed budget um, is really essential to be able to tackle our biggest environmental challenges, such as climate change, salmon recovery, and orca recovery, reducing toxic pollution, environmental justice. So with this context in mind, we felt like it was important to prioritize the state operating budget to make sure that these programs are able to function and keep the work moving forward. And environmental agencies are only 2% of our state's operating budget, and it's actually less than 1% of our state general fund. So making cuts to environmental programs is not gonna make any noticeable difference on the broader budget shortfalls and issues that and challenges that we see. Um, but in fact, cutting environmental programs will, um, push costs onto people in terms of public health outcomes and exposure to more pollution, the inability to recreate and get outside during a pandemic when we're all sick of being inside. Um, so we think it's really important to focus on four areas in the operating budget. Fair and equitable revenue, using our dedicated funding sources like our state toxic cleanup and prevention fund, MOTCA, for their intended purpose protecting natural resource agencies to keep work on track and environmental justice. Uh, and again, making sure that we are applying a racial equity lens to all spending um, in the state budget. On the capital budget part of this priority, that's where we actually see the most optimism and ability to lean forward uh, or lean in and, and, and secure more investments to have those win-win outcomes of creating jobs, improving the health of our environment, um, improving our infrastructure, and improving public health. Um, on, unlike the operating budget, natural resources is a significant portion of the capital budget. And it's because these projects are proven winners that have a very strong return on investment. We are focusing on three areas in our capital budget package. Supporting rural communities, that includes things like uh, reducing the risk and intensity of wildfire with forest health treatments, or um, adding broadband um, to these communities, or uh, giving dollars to local communities for things like community forests um, to let communities decide how to, you know, invest in natural resource and green natural resources and green infrastructure. Uh, Second is climate and clean energy. That's anything from weatherizing homes to retrofitting public buildings to making sure that our clean energy grid is ready for our transition to 100% clean energy. Finally, clean water and green infrastructure. This is a, a, a lot about kind of uh, water infrastructure, toxics uh, investments, making sure that our wastewater treatment systems are actually upgraded to not be releasing sewage into Puget Sound, uh, making sure that salmon recovery and restoration projects are on track, adding rain gardens um, and stormwater infrastructure to our existing infrastructure. So on the capital budget side, we're talking a little over $600 million of total investment that we wanna make sure we, we secure in the next budget um, to accomplish the, the goals. And then, as I mentioned, the third budget is the transportation budget, and I will hand it over to Bryce um, at Transportation Choices Coalition to talk about our clean and just transportation priority. Thanks a lot, Darcy. Again, uh, Bryce Aiden with Transportation Choices Coalition uh, here to talk about our clean and just transportation uh, ideas that we want to see move forward in the legislature this year. As was mentioned earlier by uh, Cliff, we do see a, an opportunity for a new transportation uh, budget and package to move forward with all the moving parts. So really what we're asking within this clean and just transportation is how do we invest in a sustainable and accessible and equitable transportation system? Um, this looks at, uh, you know, how do we holistically uh, work within a transportation system? Uh, how do they all combine? How do, how do highways and transit and bike pet infrastructure 
combine to actually get the outcomes we want. So what, what we have, what we notice as we work through this process is, is that, um, you know, our transportation funding in Washington is breaking down. We have uh, declining revenue and gas tax. Uh, much of our revenue sources are regressive uh, and they're heavily restricted to specific things as we know with the 18th amendment. Um, and oftentimes we're looking at investments uh, that aren't necessarily targeted to improving or achieving our state policy goals in the transportation sector that we have set out. So really we wanna combine all of these and look at how do we create a package that supports clean and just ways to fund and invest in transportation. Um, really what we wanna do is talk about, um, you know, multimodal in terms of transit and bike pet infrastructure account for about 4% of the entire transportation budget on any given year. And in reality, we got to see that uh, that portion of the transportation budget grow. We know that people are heavily reliant upon transit. It is an accessible use, uh, and and it's really important. Um, according to the to the 2018 American Community Survey, about 33% of people who rode transit are considered essential workers. These are the people we know uh, that are uh, you know at the grocery stores providing food and other things for us. Um, and so we really need to start looking at how do we provide transit service, bike ped connections, and really safe infrastructure across the system. And that means we need to find new investments, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, and really start targeting those new revenues and new investments towards things that are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also prioritize uh, environmental justice communities, communities that have been highly impacted by the pollution of the transportation system that aren't, uh, aren't directly uh, always have access to all modes of transit and really start looking at our system holistically. And so really that is part of the, the system that we're looking at moving forward and wanna see those investments occur uh, to really highlight how we can start changing and really providing uh, service to, to all, all the people of Washington. Um, and with that, you know, as I mentioned, uh, and Cliff mentioned talking about carbon money and, and really trying to find a way for our transportation system to help drive down carbon. Uh, as we know that, that transportation is the highest uh, emitter of, of carbon right now in the state. I'll pass it over to Leah to talk more about uh, the clean fuel standard and some of the great work that we can do over there. Yeah, thank you so much, Bryce. Um, so I will again talk about the clean fuel standard, which is um, HB 1036 It has been pre filed um, for this legislative session and we're really excited to get this across the finish line this year. The past two legislative sessions we've gotten close it has passed through the House twice and for, for, through the first Senate committee so we feel really optimistic that we can get this foundational climate policy through this legislative session. Next slide please. So as, um, as Bryce mentioned, uh, the transportation sector is our highest emitting sector of pollution in Washington state, accounting for about 45% of our climate pollution. And the clean fuel standard will significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions from this sector. It does this by getting dirty fuel producers to clean up their act. They can either make their fuel life cycle cleaner, including by making the process of creating their fuel more efficient, or they can pay clean fuels producers by either purchasing sustainable biofuels to blend with their own fuel or um, by purchasing credits from clean fuels producers, including electricity as a transportation fuel. So what this does is it creates a revenue source for clean fuels producers to expand their reach. It provides utility money to invest in infrastructure for transportation electrification, and it benefits public fleets and transit agencies that are already using clean fuels. So the clean fuel standard means our fuels will get cleaner while supporting the needed infrastructure for transportation electrification and for clean fuels. And therefore, we view this as a really foundational policy, as a foundational um, climate policy to decarbonize our transportation sector. So in addition um, to causing greenhouse gas pollution, the transportation sector unfortunately produces a lot of health harming air pollution as well. And as we really viscerally experienced this past year through uh, wildfires, we know that air pollution is extremely harmful to our health. And we have also learned that folks who live in highly, highly polluted areas are more susceptible to COVID unfortunately, given their already weakened respiratory systems. And 
Unfortunately, the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency has found that air pollution kills over a thousand Washingtonians annually, which is just tragic. And this pollution is also not evenly felt due to racist practices such as redlining. Um, communities of color are more likely to live in highly polluted areas and suffer those consequences. The map on this slide shows um, PM 2.5 pollution in the general Seattle area. And a study has shown that people who live in the Duwamish Valley have a lower life expectancy by about 13 years than folks who live in cleaner parts of the county. And uh, this map shows why this happens. And those really dark red areas are areas where you have the interstate, where you have um, industrial traffic and, and big diesel trucks going through. And the clean fuel standard can help change this by cutting transportation pollution. And that's why we have health organizations like the American Lung Association and the Washington Academy for Family Physicians strongly supporting the clean fuel standard. An American lung study actually showed that California's standard will um, lead to over $8 billion in averted public health costs by 2025. So again, in addition to being a really important climate policy, the clean fuel standard is also an important public health policy in our view. Next slide. So right now, um, we also send a lot of money, over $9 billion annually, to out-of-state um, oil companies in, in buying our gasoline. And this can change and we can benefit our local economy and strengthen our local economy here at home, while at the same time actually reducing our transportation costs. So locally produced electricity and clean fuels will benefit under the clean fuel standard and increase jobs in this sector, which already exists um, and, and certainly have room to grow. This will create a positive cycle in the local circular economy since it will add a revenue stream. Um, one really great example that I've heard is restaurants who sell off their used cooking oil um, or farmers who are able to monetize what was viewed as waste before that is now being uh, converted into sustainable biofuels here. So we can, um, we can really generate local jobs and, and keep our dollars here at home while at the same time, thanks to the near monopoly that oil companies have on our transportation fuels, Right now, they're charging exorbitant costs with really high profit margins, almost 80 cents per gallon in the Seattle area, which is one of the highest in the country. And they're able to do this because of this near monopoly. So um, what a clean fuel standard will do is help break this monopoly and how and allow folks to access cheaper, cleaner transportation um, fuel choices. So electricity, as you can see on this slide, costs about a third as much as um, gasoline in order to fuel your vehicle. And multiple studies have shown that under a clean fuel standard, the cost of getting around will actually decrease while investing in our local economy. Next slide, please. So the clean fuel standard has arisen as a Democratic caucus priority in both chambers of the state legislature due to these multiple benefits, due to these climate, health, and economic benefits. But it's really important to note that the standard has broad support across Washington. Multiple polls have shown nearly two to one margins in support of a clean fuel standard with majority support geographically across the state, including in swing districts. And we've also seen majority support hold in polling even after negative messaging about the clean fuel standard. Um, these two polls shown on the slide are from our uh, last session, but as Cliff mentioned earlier, we have more recent polling that affirms this really strong support that we are excited to share with you all soon. Um, the clean fuel standard, again, is a, is a climate priority this session, and we're really excited to get it to the governor's desk. It's a strong climate priority, environment priority, health priority, and economic priority. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Zachary. Thank you so much, Leah. Uh, and Darcy, I'm wondering if you could just share a quick um, bit about our partnership agenda priorities before I move to questions. Yeah, one thing that we do uh, through the Priorities Coalition is um, want to help support and amplify important work around environmental progress um, that is being led by partner organizations. Um, and so every year we adopt a partnership agenda. This year we have four partnership agenda items. Um, the Healthy Environment for All Act or the HEAL Act, which comes out of the uh, Environmental Justice Task Force from the last year. Um, voting justice, there's two different voting um, justice bills that we are supporting um, through the partnership agenda. Um, the working families tax credit and making sure that that gets those dollars get to people more efficiently um, and making sure that that, that um, system works more uh, without with less red tape and, and again gets people money faster. And then um, the Worker Protection Act to make sure that uh, 
laws to protect workers from discrimination or harassment or safety violations that they that they have all of the tools available to really um, uh, hold their employers accountable. Thank you, Darcy. And you can find more information about all of the priorities and our partnership uh, agenda priorities at our website, um, Washington WECProtects.org, and it's under Environmental Priorities Coalition, or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, now I'd like to open it up to questions, and I see we have a